my favorite part. <laughs> uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know. Uh, I'm Fred Blackwell, CEO of the San Francisco Foundation, and I am the chair for tonight's program. Uh, this program is part of the San Francisco Foundation series focused on people, power, and place, uh, addressing access and equity in the Bay Area, supported by the San Francisco Foundation's Bay Area Leads Fund. Uh, today's program, uh, we thought it was provocative. Enemy of the state, how the media are evolving in a fact fear environment. Uh, we thought it was provocative, but then as we're sitting here, uh, the president is actually today um, issuing his fact-free or fake news uh, awards. Um, less than a month into his presidency, Donald Trump tweeted uh, that the fake news media is not my enemy, it's the enemy of the American people. Uh, how does this rhetoric change the public's trust in the media and the role journalism plays in a democratic society at a time when social media has changed the way that we receive information? With misinformation and partisan content influencing public opinion, journalism is reimagining its role in what some are fearing has become a fact-free and post-truth environment. According to a, a 2016 Gallup poll, only 32% of Americans felt that they had a great deal or a fair amount of trust in the media. The media are finding ways to adapt in this current environment and while continuing to inform an increasingly divided audience. Today, we are bringing together the Bay Area's leading journalists and social media professionals to discuss the convergence of journalism, social media, and the news. And it's now my pleasure to introduce the panelists. Uh, first is Pete Davies, who is Director of Project Management at LinkedIn, or Product Management at LinkedIn. He leads feed and content product teams at LinkedIn, where he obsesses about the best ways to discover and engage with content, Pete was previously a BBC journalist and radio producer before moving to the Bay Area in 2005. He has since led product teams at Automatic, makers of WorldPress.com, uh, The Medium, and founded his own company, which was later sold to LinkedIn. So welcome, Pete. Um, in addition to Pete, we have Holly Kernan, uh, who is KQED's vice president of the news. Uh, she returned to KQED in 2014 after more than a decade at KALW's News and Public Affairs Director. Holly has had a long career and award as an award-winning journalist, television, radio host, executive producer, and editor. She previously worked as the producer at KQED's Forum and director of the, and producer of the California Report. She has taught at journalism at Mills uh, in Oakland and University of California, Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. Welcome, Holly. Um, in addition to Holly, we've got Al Letson, who is the host of the Peabody Award-winning Reveal News and Public Radio program at the Center for Investigative Reporting. He is also a playwright, performance poet, and actor. And he is the host and executive producer of State of the Reunion, a public radio program airing on more than 200 stations, which won a 2013 Edward R. Murrow Award. Um, and we got an old version of his uh, bio. He actually lives here now, uh, but I will mention he used to divide his time between Jacksonville, Florida, uh, and the Emeryville office. I mentioned that because I, I know there are probably a few Jags fans in the audience. Um, Carolina Nunez, uh, welcome, Al. And in addition to, um, Carol to Al, um, Carolina Nunez is the vice president and regional news director for Univision, Northern California. For more than 15 years, she has created content for Hispanic broadcasting, radio, television, and digital uh, in Miami, Los Angeles, in the Bay Area. Born in Bogota, Colombia, she was raised uh, in Caracas, Venezuela. She spends most of her current time uh, with the challenge of trying to teach Spanish to her daughter, Victoria. <laughs> uh, welcome uh, to all of them. And just one last uh, introduction that I want to make and actually hand it over uh, to her in a minute. Uh, today, our moderator is Mina Kim, uh, and she is KQED's evening anchor and Friday host of Forum. Uh, Mina started her career in public radio as an intern at KQED, becoming the general assignment reporter, then health reporter for the California Report. Her work has been recognized by radio, television, digital news, news association, the Society of Professional Journalists, 
and the Asian American Journalists Association. Welcome all the panelists as I turn it over to Mina. Uh, but once again, Carolina Nunez, Al Letson, Holly Kernan, Pete Davies, and I'm Mina Kim. <laughs> And good evening, everybody. It's an honor to once again be moderating this important series by the San Francisco Foundation. And Fred Blackwell really laid out well, I think, the challenges, the, the climate that the media are operating in today, influenced largely by a president, which they quoted in the title of this segment, who has spent a, a year essentially berating the mainstream media and, and pitting media organizations against each other by declaring those favorable to him as honest and those that refute or question him as fake or politically motivated, case in point, today's fake news awards, uh, though I heard that the execution of that wasn't quite what they expected. Um, but, you know, the effect is that it contributes to people feeling unable to agree on a basic floor of facts. And so it was no surprise there was a poll released today by NPR that found that 90 percent of Republicans lack confidence in the media three quarters of independents and 42% of Democrats. There is this other reality as well besides the climate that the media is dealing with and that is the effect of the administration's policies which is a whole nother part of this. So things like declaring immigrant or faith communities enemies, the most recent using vulgar slurs to refer to African nations, um, Policies like travel bans, uh, ending protected status for Salvadorans or Haitians that wreak havoc on the communities, the networks, the users that we serve. And that's another sort of parallel reality that the media deals with as it's also dealing with what has essentially been viewed as, as a pretty hostile climate. So that's what we will be discussing tonight, these two realities with this very esteemed panel. And I would be saying that even if the person I worked for wasn't. <laughs> 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 but let me just start with a basic question so that we can remind our audience, um, who is the audience that you serve in terms of size and geographic location? And I'll start with you, Carolina Nunez. Um, Latinos in the Bay Area, and in this case in Northern California. And it doesn't matter if they speak Spanish or not or what generation they are. Uh, with Reveal, we are, uh, we're on about 400 uh, public radio stations across the country uh, and, and, uh, and podcast listeners. Uh, we serve the entire Bay Area and all of California. Uh, LinkedIn is a professional, uh, professional network uh, with about 530 members across the world, 530 million members across the world. <laughs> <laughs> It's a critical word in that. Yeah. <laughs> That's important. Yeah. Fact check. There's a lot of users. <laughs> um, so let's start with the anti-media rhetoric, um, just because I think it's very fresh um, on our minds, because there's been a lot of it today. Have you seen any effect on your audience, some erosion of trust perhaps, maybe more challenges to your content? I guess I'm curious what examples you feel like you have seen that are a result of essentially a hostile media climate. Um, and I can start with you, Carolina, as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess for us, um, number one, we don't, we don't necessarily see ourselves as the, as the enemy in, by any means of anyone. <laughs> so uh, if there's anything that's been uh, Happening uh, with the new administration, I think it's the the reinvigorate the reinvigoration of, of of our purpose with our community. Um, our relation with our community it's always been really close, um, and it's really I think it's different. It's almost like family. They they count on us for many things, but now it's it's um, it's it's a commitment that goes beyond everything. Oh. With their, they're constantly needing this information for literally uh, to be able to build their lives here. So uh, for us, it's just um, reinforce our commitment with them. 
So it's almost had sort of the opposite effect where, where people are actually an outpouring of appreciation because of the attacks. Has, has it been that way for you as you've experienced it nationally at CIR, at the Center for Investigative Reporting? Yeah, I think that uh, at CIR, two, two things have happened. Uh, one is that I think that there is a hunger for what we do, which is investigative journalism. Uh, and so we, we, we have seen our numbers grow. Um, right after the election of President Trump, uh, I interviewed Richard Spencer before he was, you know, as well known as he is now, and uh, and we got a huge bump from that. And we—he's the head of the white separatists. Yeah, he's he's uh, yeah he's he's a white supremacist, um, and um, and and so we saw a huge jump there. Uh, I would say that. Uh, part of the problem now becomes, uh, you know, if you want to have conversations with people who are uh, conservative or people who are um, a part of the Trump administration, there, there is no trust there whatsoever. Uh, where there may have been skeptical years past, uh, now there's like no real inroads there. So it can be kind of complicated to, to tell a full story. It's interesting that you bring up interviewing Richard Spencer because I feel like in some ways that was a direct result of this post-2016 moment when media organizations were saying to themselves, were we in a bubble? Like, how did we not see this coming? Do we need to reach out more to the white working class or do we need to reach out to people who have created narratives about their experience that, that we don't typically have on our air? Um, and I imagine that that was... It, do you think that that was a calculation in terms of bringing Spencer on for you? Uh, a little bit. I mean, I think that like after the election, what the feeling in the newsroom was is that we, we have to like rethink everything. But with Richard Spencer, um, initially we were working on an episode of Reveal. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that we kind of took for granted that we thought uh, Hillary Clinton was going to win. And so... Uh, and Richard Spencer, we were doing sort of a um, a, a, a profile of him, um, which, you know, in, in our minds, uh, we never talked about this, but I think in our minds, the idea was that we'll do a profile of this guy who completely has no power now. So, you know, we, we whatever. You're right, um, right. And then Trump won, and me and uh, the executive producer, Kevin Sullivan, we're sitting in his office and we're like, there's no way in the world we can do a profile on this guy now. Like, we have to go after him. So that's when we, uh, we, we turned it. And it, it was really quick. I mean, the, Trump won and the very next day I was talking to him. He didn't have any idea. I, I, I think he was surprised when he found out I was African American because we did it all over the phone, um, which was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's interesting, uh, Holly Curtin, how Al Letson has brought up this notion of shoring up trust, especially with people who are more conservative. And I feel like that's something that you have also tried to tackle as well. Can you talk a little bit about how KQED has tried to do that? Um, yeah, I mean, one thing I will say about, I think, public media is that we tend to have strong trust from our audiences, and that trust is our currency. It's our most prized um, asset. Um, but about a year ago, right after the election, I got so many calls from people from all over the political spectrum that were just so angry with media's coverage of the election. Everybody got it wrong, and they were so angry. And um, if anybody wants to ask a question, I can talk about what I think the media did get wrong um, and frequently continue to do so. Um, but so when I get those calls, uh, I... I really like to just listen. Well, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more about what we're doing wrong. And so I had hundreds of these calls with people. Um, and what was really interesting, and in fact, KQD's board felt this way, some of the staff, people wanted to sort of understand what is journalism. So I had a lot of conversations trying to explain to people what the difference is between somebody who practices journalism and trying to explain that it really is um, a practice where you're putting on this other hat that is totally different than your civilian self. Your civilian self has all kinds of opinions mm -hmm. and you know when you're talking to somebody you're trying to persuade, etc. As a journalist you're thinking with a whole different mentality and it's really about curiosity, answering a question, trying to get this full range of facts and, and a comprehensive perspective on the world and what you're trying to do is, is search for truth and then try to um, 
consolidate all of that information into something that people can consume in a fairly short span of time. And so a lot of what we did this last year, I think, um, our newsroom was completely shocked. Um, and I think that had to do with the fact that the cable news networks and every other media outlet told mm -hmm. us over and over and over, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton has got this victory. There's this tiny little Hail Mary pass possibly that Trump could get mm -hmm. through, but no, that'll never happen. And, um, and in fact, I talked to a pundit the week before the election who told me, well, Hillary's obviously going to win mm -hmm. because they have no ground game in Wisconsin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right? Oh, okay. Sure. That worked out. Um, but so <laughs> just we did a lot of talking in our newsroom about what is our role in society. And our role is as professional observers. And we subscribe to a code of ethics. And professional journalists have editors. And we do fact checking. And there's just a whole process that we go through. And so we did a lot of talking to people about yes. that to, to sort of um, substantiate that trust. And in fact, um, our product department, Colleen Wilson, is here. And we're trying to put some transparency on our website about how we do what we do so that people can understand it. Well, and the, some of these question cards are also reminding me that, that we KQED tried to convene dialogues, right, events where you actually have people from different political perspectives talking to each other as a way to, to shore up trust but also bridge differences, which I think was another, another goal post when you're, you're realizing just how polarized we are. Yeah, but I mean, that's what we do every day. We, 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 this is what we've been right. doing for decades and decades. We had to be more right? explicit about it. We had to be it, more explicit about it. And also, the interesting thing about KQD's audience is they tell us they want multiple perspectives. They don't want to just hear what they already know or believe, and they've been really explicit mm. about that, and it's one thing that I really appreciate um, about our media, but they also wanted a venue to talk to each other to try and bridge some of those divides. Well, Pete Davies, in terms of shoring up trust, you've talked a lot about just having an in-house editorial team at LinkedIn, and, and that it's been fairly, like you had avoided some of the pitfalls that, say, Facebook <laughs> fell into when it tried to engage an editorial team in terms of news and being accused of conservative bias, or yes, basically <laughs> liberal bias, but anti-conservative mm. bias. Yeah, and I, I think it's a, uh, for our editorial team, a, a real challenge is to make sure that they are translating the news that is, uh, that is everywhere, like whether it's the national news, whether it's business news, but news that impacts people uh, in, their, in their jobs and in their careers and in their professional lives. And sometimes it's easier to avoid the, the one-sidedness of a particular story there because I think the, the, the lens and the way in which we try to convey that is how, how does it impact you and your job? And one of the things that we've talked about is that uh, we're often, I think, in it, a lot of news audiences, people want to hear about the politics. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking about it, how it impacts people, often it's the policy that is more meaningful. And I'll give you an example, which is uh, actually, interestingly, people did not talk a ton about politics on LinkedIn. Uh, until they sort of had the decorum of a professional setting because it's exactly a professional right. I think website. It, it, it imitates a little bit uh, how people talk and engage with each other at work. And we don't ordinarily in, in, in most workplaces actually go and talk politics. Uh, it's just one of those taboo subjects that's actually hard to bring up and hard to engage. And you probably are more likely to try to avoid. Uh, but I think we, we've seen a little change in that, but more because people want to talk about issues that are affecting them from politics. And, and one big example uh, that you know, comes and goes, uh, as all these stories do over the last 12 months, is uh, H-1B and, and visas. Where, so visas, obviously, are tremendously impactful. A lot of our audience skews towards tech audiences as well, and visas are a big issue for them. And so people's own experiences of what they're feeling if they're on a visa and how it may impact them, of their colleagues and wanting to talk and empathize with their issues of, and, and challenges that they may be having, or their companies, if they're, if they're managers or employ people, and what it means for their employees to be in it. And so we see people coming together to talk around those issues. So what you're doing is actually kind of segueing into this other reality that I was talking about with media, which is that policy and the policy choices of this administration have, have shaped uh, conversations, shaped your network or audience, right? And I know, Carolina Nunez, for you at Univision, I mean, that it really has been <laughs> this administration's 
policy proposals or uh, you know actual things that they have implemented that have affected your community most or more than say a hostile media climate that this administration may be may be stoking. So can you talk a little bit about about how your audience has been reacting to things like the news today or the news that dropped last night from the San Francisco Chronicle that said that ICE is planning a major raid at some future date here in Northern California, right? But, you know, ICE is not confirming or denying, yeah. right? And you've got um, elected leaders reacting. I mean, how do you, as a news director, make a decision about reporting a story like that? And what effect does it have on, on the community you serve? Um, so the first thing I do have to say as reference is that uh, for us in Univision, really, we're covering this administration the same way as we cover any administration. I, we have to, I, I want to set up that first. Uh, with the Obama administration, we also ask the, our questions about not keeping promises and immigration and such. That so. is the deporter in chief. Exactly. So it's really uh, the same for us. Uh, but the landscape is completely different for, for my audience. So um, the first thing that that it's constantly in, in my mind and the minds of all news, local news directors and, and network in Univision is um, to be really judicious about not not creating panic for our audience because the headlines can be really alarming. Uh, and so th that's the first thing. So how are you going to unpack and flesh out the information in a way that is useful, that gives tools to our audience to react and make decisions uh, every day. So I, I think that's that's really like yesterday with, with the, that headline, which is really vague, and it sounds more like a thread. How do you handle that? And and first thing is to, to talk about what's out there. Like in the Bay Area, for example, we have a fantastic, um, um, basically com community-built um, emergency response uh, um, group that's created by organi pro immigrants organization. They have they have created this. They have phone numbers uh, where you can send text and communicate about rates, and that is really a super helpful uh, tool for my community. So make make my community aware of that. Your know your rights. Really, how to react in a moment of emergency? Do you have a family plan uh, about how if something really happens, you know what to do? Do you know if you're in the priority of deportations or or not, and how to find that out. Like, there's so many things that you can do besides just get stuck in the headline and the the sort of the provocative side of it. Um, so that's really what we do. So that people feel some level yeah. of agency. Uh, Al, let's in, in terms of how the administration's policies are affecting the audiences you serve, have you seen or been able to kind of encapsulate some sense of, of, a, of a change or reaction? Yeah, I think that um, you, the, the, the big change that I've seen uh, is the, the type of listener feedback that I get now. Mm. Um, prior to uh, the Trump administration, I really didn't get a lot of listener feedback. Um, on iTunes, we had like reviews and ratings, but um, but now people write me specifically to tell me when they have problems with stories that we do, and uh, and you can see like we we did a story about uh, PizzaGate, which was the idea that there was that Hillary Clinton um, and her campaign was running a child uh, sex ring, sex ring yeah. in a pizza place in, yeah. Um, and it inspired someone to go there Right, and it armed. inspired somebody to go there armed, and, uh, and he thought that there were going to be children in the basement. The, the restaurant doesn't have a basement. Um, and so, yeah, like I got several angry emails from people saying that we just didn't get it, that we didn't understand that this was a much bigger thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, of those type of emails. Uh, people are angry um, in a way that I'd, I'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, I've, I've been in public radio now for, uh, I'm going on my 10th year. 
Uh, and in all this time, like this is the first time that that I've ever seen it. And, you know, with Reveal, uh, we went hard on the Obama administration, uh, specifically on what was going on in the border and the deportations um, and didn't get half the type of pushback that we see now when you when you do the exact same type of coverage with the Trump administration. So it's an interesting time. Mm. <laughs> Not just the. Um the policies themselves, right, Holly Kernan, but it's also the, the pace with which they are coming from this administration. I think that's been one of the mm -hmm. hardest things for news organizations to deal with is 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 the, the I mean, and, and it's not small things, onslaught, right? There, yeah. There's kind of this onslaught of, of things that have huge implications for, for communities and, and how to deal with them. Um, I know that uh, that's a conversation we've had quite a bit, yes. right, about about how do you how would you characterize how the newsroom is feeling <laughs> around that <laughs> that pace and how you're trying to address it? Um, well, I would say that people are exhausted. Um, it's just such a constant avalanche of news. I think it's intentional this kind of chaos, um, and it's it's hard to cover. It's also hard because a lot of the time you're being reactive and that doesn't give you as much time to be agenda setting and to do a lot of the important local watchdog coverage that is so important to our democracy. Um, but I will say, so we've expanded, our audience has expanded, um, people are saying they want more from us. We went from being a five day a week news service to a seven day a week news service. We're, we've uh, beefed up our staff because what we were doing was scrambling to cover all of the news events um, locally on weekends. So that's, that's really good. Um, and people are responding to that. So I feel really great about that. But people are tired. So yeah, I'm telling people that they need to take breaks and they need to, you know, go home <laughs> and they need to, I mean, just pace ourselves, right? And, and make sure that we have enough staff to spell us. But there's so much public interest journalism out there. And I, I'd like Mina just to say, um, respond to the wonderfully provocative title of this panel, um, Enemies of, of the People or Enemies of the State. Enemy, right? I think yeah, Enemies I mean, of the American People is the phrase that our president used. Um, and, and living through a, a fact-free, um, in, in a fact-free time. I don't think that's true. I think most people are still paying attention to news sources that they trust, that do things like fact-checking and sourcing and, and have editors, et cetera. Um, I think it's a small percentage of the population that is sort of living in that so-called alternative fact world. Um, unfortunately, one of those people is living in the White House. But, um, that, but, but can I just yeah, say yeah, one yeah, more quick please, thing? Please, please, um, please. I, the thing that I think is dangerous about the words enemy of the American people is that you say something long enough, it sticks, right? Um, and people already have historic levels of distrust in institutions of our democracy, and it is a participatory democracy, and if people don't participate, it's not gonna work. Um, so I think that the silver lining is that people are ready to participate. They want good information. They wanna talk to their neighbors. They wanna hear these things. And enemy of the American people doesn't matter because of us. It matters because we're sort of the canaries in the coal mine. It's the First Amendment because it's first, because it underpins all of our democratic institutions. And media is called the fourth estate because it's supposed to be this fourth branch of government that holds everybody accountable. And that's why I think you who are in the audience should care about this and should push back against this oxymoron of fake news um, and against phrases that are designed to demean and diminish people like enemy of the American people. Well, I also because I think, I, I, I mean, I think I would add to that, that enemy of the people, it, it, it legitimizes uh, and, and encourages a certain anger towards the fourth estate or, or media. But I'd like to get your reaction to this, this question oh. from, from uh, an audience member, which asks, would the mainstream media ever consider not attending the Sanders sham show, which they're talking about the White House press briefings, and do a separate press update for We the People? This could be real news. And, and the reason that I find this question interesting is because I think it's something that, that organizations go through when, when you're reporting on the president, right? It's this question of what do you do when there are distortions or when the president 
says something very provocative in a tweet or in a meeting, right? And you've got your local stories that you want to be able to report on or your statewide or other national stories that are of interest and of importance, right? And you don't want those to, you know, get torpedoed essentially, right? By by something like this. Do you do you ignore it? Do you try, you know, like, do you try to do something and say, okay, we're just not even going to pay attention to this because this isn't real, right? Or is there a danger in doing that as well? And you want to take it out? Well, I, I, I work on a weekly show, so we're not, you know, like, we're not in the same Subject position the as... Same frenetic pace. Yeah, as, as KQED is. Um, so we, we can ignore it. I mean, we'll find another way to, like, work it into... Like, it'll be maybe the genesis for another show down the, the, the road, but we're not really looking to respond to it because we come out like a week after it happens. Um, but I, I, I would say, like, the answer to that question is would the news media not do it? No, I think that they're always going to go to the, uh, to the White House briefing because they don't want to be scooped by somebody else. It's the, um, it's the ecosystem that we're in. Uh, that basically, like, so if NBC says that we're not going to go and something happens at that uh, press conference and CNN is the one that gets it and NBC missed out because they weren't there, you know, heads are going to roll. So everybody's going to show up for it. I think that maybe what we need to be doing better as the news media is putting it all in context. Um, like, y you know, maybe we shouldn't be reporting on his tweets at all um, because clearly, like, his... his I have a you know, opinion. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I put that out there. I, I wanted to respond to something that, that, that Holly said, though. I agree wholeheartedly uh, with, with what you were saying about like the, that term, like we, we need to get away from it. I think for me, when I think about a fact-free environment, though, I'm not thinking about the press being fact-free. I'm thinking about the facts not mattering anymore. The fact that like all of these things can happen, like, you know, what we've basically been shown by the Trump administration is that a lot of things that we thought of as laws and, um, and, and pillars of our society were really just traditions. And traditions can be wiped away and new traditions can be born. And so if they were just traditions and they weren't actually, like tradition of if you are running for the highest office in the land, you're going to show your tax returns so that we can know where your money's at and we can know if you're making decisions based on that money. Um, like that was a tradition, that's not a law. Um, the, the tradition of the fact that, that if you are taking the highest office, you divest yourself from all of your, um, all of, all of your, your, your businesses so that we know that you're not making decisions based on you financially making money, and, and, and that really didn't happen. Um, and there have been plenty of uh, people trying to follow up on it, but there, it, it doesn't carry any weight. So for me, like the idea of fact-free isn't really about whether the facts matter or not. To me, it's about whether the facts have consequence. And what we've seen is that in this world that we're in right now, they really don't. Um, they, I, I mean, the fact that the President of the United States disparaged um, other countries uh, in, a, in a meeting and part uh, uh, the party that he's a part of can't even admit to the fact that he did it, there's going to be no consequence for that. There's going to be no consequence for the fact that he really hasn't divested himself from his businesses, that his children are running it, which means that's not di di divestment. There's, there's no consequence for that. So to me, that's what I think of when I think of fact-free. Not that we're not telling the facts, but that they don't matter anymore. But I think most Holly people, Kirk. sorry. No. I think, though, most people, though, are still living in, in a place where truth matters to them and where they mm -hmm. want to hear these facts. Yeah. And I think there will be consequences. I do think that, that there will be consequences eventually. I mean, that's up to everybody out there and you know, actually participating in our democracy. That's what it's going to bring about know. consequences. I, I, want, I, want to have, I, I, I want to be more optimistic. I do. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I am an optimistic person. <laughs> I really am. But I, 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 am, um, I think about, so Let's just like, put aside the, the, the Trump uh, administration um, and think about like, what were the consequences of us going into Iraq? 
with really bad intelligence and a whole administration that basically was lying to us. What were the consequences for all the members of that administration? There were none. Like when it comes down to um, people in, in, in power in America, consequences seem to not be a thing. Now, consequences for everybody in this room are, are, are real and true. But um, when you look at the financial crash that happened, like who paid for that? Where are the consequences in that? So for me, I, I, I'm beginning to lose, I don't have a whole lot of hope that we will see consequence. I think the, the biggest consequence we'll see is that maybe the House and the Senate will turn over, maybe, um, you know, a couple years from now, we'll have a different president. Maybe that would be a consequence. I think. Well, laws I guess are what I don't passed. understand is confidence in whom, right? When you say that you don't have a lot of confidence that there will be consequences, you mean the electorate will not react? Is that what you mean? Like, who are you feeling like you don't have confidence in? I feel like most Americans that I know are good, hardworking people that are busy taking care of their lives, which, you know, looks differently for every individual, but also has a lot of commonality, right? So, like, we're, we're, we're all trying to take care of our kids. We're all trying to pay our mortgage. We're all trying to do good at work. We want advances and raises. We want to love the people around us, and that's a full-time job. It's a lot. You know, like, if you've, if you've got kids, I mean, we were talking in the back, and you said that you commute in, like, 30 some odd miles, which seemed like wow to me. But, um, but that's, that's a, a lot, that you, you have a very full life. The idea that people who are carrying these full American lives will be able to focus themselves and move in a direction that hold these people in power in, in consequence when it's much easier to just say that the system is gonna work the way it's always been working and we've seen that it's broken. So I don't know, I don't, I don't know if that consequence can come. I don't know if Trump is enough to shake us up. Um, it, it, it maybe not, you know, I don't know. Well, I think the jury's out, but I think you're right when you say that people live very full lives and what does make them react is feeling the consequences. And I think that, I, I think this is the question, right? Is whether or not what is transpiring will create enough of a real and felt consequence to push people to act. And my hope is, is that it will. But going back to my earlier question about um, you know, how we make these choices around reporting national things and local things, because I think part of the solution, or at least the hope, right, is that, is that ultimately because we are you know, living and, and trying to make it through our daily lives, that, that local issues, right, local institutions, highlighting those kinds of things will actually, you know, make people engage much more uh, with, with, with media, with what's happening in their own lives to then, you know, make decisions based on that. And that can create some kind of a collective conscience that I feel like we're lamenting is, is being lost right now. Um, I'm hearing from people all the time that they're really hungry for those kinds of connections, for those opportunities to meet. We're putting together more live events to sort of facilitate that for people. And um, I think people are really hungry for community and belonging. And um, I'm, I'm hearing that from, from them. I will say, again, with um, sort of media as the canary in the coal mine, what we have lost over the last 15 years as so many newspapers have left is local journalism. Um, and I think it was the Pew study, I have it here somewhere, um, said that people have much more trust in local media um, than they do in national media, in institutions that are local and that can um, that they can touch and see. Um, but those are the very institutions that we've lost as we've lost so many journalists and journalistic outlets. I mean, just in the Bay Area, which is a rich area, we've lost hundreds and hundreds of people that used to cover our schools and our city councils and government watchdog reporting and all of those kinds of things that I think help bind people together. Um, and so 
I, I think it's up to people um, to really say this is something that, that matters. It's a cornerstone to our democracy. And, you know, we're actually addressing quite a few of the questions that we're getting from the audience, but I think you answered in, in some sense this question as a longtime member of the media. I saw for years, well before Trump, the erosion of trust in the media. It is not new. How much do you think this is due to many media organizations, small to large, gutting staff and resources year after year? Um, it's interesting that you that we talk about connectivity and people wanting to do that because it reminds me of the words that Facebook used to to justify its decision to um, to suppress news and its news feeds in favor of uh, posts from friends and family to create more meaningful connection. And the idea is that you know it will or at least their stated purposes, these more meaningful interactions, right, could potentially create bridges. But I'm curious, Pete Davies, what you think of this decision to no longer prioritize publishers' posts, that includes news outlets' posts, and whether you think, as somebody that is on a social network, that it will make echo chambers actually worse, which is what some media professionals, including Audrey Cooper, the San Francisco Chronicle, have been very vocal about. So uh, I'm going to avoid commenting directly on what Facebook's done, but I will happily talk about how we think about this. Um, why and, not? Know, I mean, I, why not? I think that the, uh, the, 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 the role of news and information uh, and uh, ideas, perspectives that people have is absolutely critical to seeding conversations. And so... I think that, that how we think about what Facebook is talking about doing and about the goals of getting people to talk with each other and have constructive conversations with each other uh, can't, uh, can't be done effectively without having high quality uh, ideas, journalism, facts, information coming for people to talk about with each other. And so uh, as we think about this, we absolutely see a role for uh, for whether it's publishers, whether it's independent journalists, I think that like it's it's very easy to think of established legacy publishers as as losers in something like this, and not to think of how we can allow people to have good constructive conversations with each other around information that comes from somewhere else. And I don't think Facebook is saying, uh, and I certainly we would not say that this content is like is a bad thing. But the passive consumption of it, and I think this is something that I've read in, uh, as they've talked about it, the passive consumption of media is, is just not the goal of that platform. Like, there are, there are other places where passive consumption of video uh, or reading can be done, and what they want to do is build a platform where people engage and talk about it. And that's pretty similar to, to our goal, too. So, uh, so just purely from our perspective, I think that the, the role of... Uh, well thought through ideas to help people talk about things is super important. And then I would just say personally that I think that there is an opportunity here, and you know, I am not, I'm, I'm, I'm not thankfully like working for a company, for, for a news media that, that needs to think through this and needs to fund its newsrooms and needs to fund its local news operations, which I agree are like imperative. But, but there is an opportunity to take, take a moment and think about building more direct relationships with audiences. Like for we, news organizations, for news organizations, like this has been a long running, uh, a, a long running process by which uh, you you can see like in in lots of different ways as Facebook, as Twitter, and as other social platforms have gained uh, really audience and, and just time and attention from people. Uh, everyone has looked to those to become their market maker to help them distribute their content. And yet, at the same time, we see and you know we we have here three. Uh, Three news organizations that have actually built re built really solid, like really important relationships directly with their listeners and viewers. And I think that that is a lesson. And you look at some other publications that are doing well at a high level, like the New York Times, the Economist, the Washington Post, all organizations that really think about how they how their brand builds a relationship or enable to build build subs subscriptions with it. Uh, elsewhere. Uh, newsletters and individuals who just build direct relationships with audiences. And, and that's where you get trust. So you're saying focus less energy in trying to get your stuff on the ne social network and focus more energy on directly engaging and reaching out with audiences. I think that the social networks can be actually a good way to do that. But you need to do that with in mind of trying to build a direct relationship rather than in some way just being willing to, uh, to delegate that relationship and that distribution. Do you have a reaction? Yeah, that totally ignores the fact that 
Facebook is the black hole that sucks everything down. Like, a monopoly. You, it, it, you, you have to, as a media organization, you have to engage with Facebook. And no matter what Facebook says about what it wants to be, it needs to look at what it is. What it is. Amen. So oh, oh, I, I hear this talk about Facebook like we want to be this, we want to be that, and so we're going to do this. But this is what you are. What you are is a platform that has been used to offset our democracy. And what Twitter is, is the exact same thing. And as long as they run around saying, like, this is what we want to be, and this is where we're aspirational, but not looking at who they actually are, they can't fix the problem. And I'm sorry, like, I can tell you as a, a person who ran his own company in media, um, you have to engage with Facebook. Like, you, you don't have a choice. You have to pay money to Facebook to get your feeds in front of people or else no one will see it. You don't have a choice with it. LinkedIn is a much different uh, environment. It, it's so different than, than, than Facebook is. But with Facebook, like, you absolutely have to do it. You cannot ignore it. Because if you don't ignore it, because I did ignore it, and I'll tell you, like, I can tell you <laughs> what it did to my organization. I, I was, there, there was, uh, when my organization started, there was another organization that started the exact same time. <laughs> they started uh, buying Facebook ads, and they started, um, um, you know, basically what, what me and my business partner thought, like, oh, they're buying likes. We're not going to buy likes. We're going to, like, go out and give great <laughs> media, and people will come to us, and they will love us, and we will be great. And no. no I totally get it. No. Okay? I totally get it, Al Letson, that Facebook has required media to get on its platform because Absolutely. it's been and then able to draw. Us. Right. It did draw more than half of Americans to go to that site to get their news, Right. But hey, they've decided they're not so into news anymore, right? Yeah. And because and they as decided. irresponsible as that might feel to media organizations, I guess we're just left with the question of what are we going to do about it, right? And I think that that's what Pete is getting at a little bit. It's like, you just realized right that I, it is I, forcing I, the question of yes, how I, I, much I, I think are that you going right. to focus on I think that Pete is right in that sense is that like here we are now we got to figure something out but I just mm -hmm. I don't want to rewrite history and say that oh, like no. these people <laughs> like 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 Facebook says that they 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 don't want to be x but they were x they are x they And it's hard to be uh, x and it's, <laughs> And, but but honestly, like, stop. what what needs to happen is that social media organizations need to recognize that they have a responsibility, just the way news platforms have a responsibility. And if people are, are putting out false uh, stories on your platform, and just because you're getting money from them does not make it okay. And if, if, if Twitter has millions of fake accounts that are in, in influencing us, like we know that there are fake accounts and they know it and all they have to do is go in and fix it, but they don't want to do it because there's a financial underpinning to it. So like they have to take responsibility. They, it, I'm sorry, like you may have started off as a bunch of tech bros having a good time, but it's the big time now. We are at the big table, step up and act like an adult. Well, it's interesting because... Yay. Mina, can I just say one other thing? Yes, please. What I think just happened this week is that Mark Zuckerberg basically said, we can't solve the problem of weaponized disinformation, so we're just going to stop doing anything yes. about it. And I think it's a total abdication of responsibility. Yeah, there, a lot of media analysts basically Holly says say they, so realized much better how, than me. They, <laughs> they, they realized how hard it actually is to be a media organization. Duh. And they've thrown in the towel. It's hard work. <laughs> And it's, it's kind of funny because this person wrote, LinkedIn isn't the first social media company that jumps to mind when I think of these issues. I'm curious, did the Commonwealth <laughs> Club invite Facebook? And if so, what was their response? Of course, Gail. they invited Facebook. <laughs> and Facebook declined. Um, but, but I think I, I want to ask this question because I've gotten so many of them around this, and this is slightly moving in a different direction. But I've gotten several questions like this. What did the press do wrong regarding the 2016 presidential election? There is sub this is another person. There is substantive evidence that Trump as a candidate benefited immensely from the cable media's coverage of him, even if all there was to cover was false statements. Have you ref guys reflected on what needs to be done to better choose what should be covered? Last one. Please comment on the media's role in electing the president by the amount of coverage they gave him. <laughs> so this is clearly something that several members of the audience want an answer. Who would like to start? 
<laughs> is this a guy? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I I I just um, I I would say that that notion that we choose to cover something or not, it's really I don't think it's true. We we just report what's happening. I disagree. I think, I think I think it's true about your wide. organization. Yeah. I think that what we're talking <laughs> about we're talking about the cable news we're networks about cable, primarily right. that broadcast nonstop a sort of reality show approach to politics, yes. which I think is really damaging to our democracy. I think this kind of, oh, look who's winning this week, look who's losing this week, is really, really bad. And it treats us as spectators and consumers and not citizens. Sorry, I'm really mad about this. <laughs> um, and you know, the media sort of understood the Trump, Trump phenomenon and didn't understand the Bernie phenomenon and felt this uh, obligation to be fair and balanced and somehow every foible that was uncovered of Trump, you had to find something that was commensurate with Hillary so that you could sort of appear to be fair and balanced, which is lazy BS journalism, in my opinion. Um, and we keep doing it, though, and we're, we're well, turning into this reality show yeah. where people are screaming at each other across polarization, and polarization is actually making a lot of money for a lot of people, yep. but it is not good for us, sorry, yeah. No, 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 you, you said everything I wanted to say. I, <laughs> well, and, and, I, I don't think of it as, as, as a reality show, I think of it as sports. I think that politics has, has turned into sports now, and you have to work, uh, you have to root for your team no matter what. So if, look, I'm a Jaguar fan. Like, <laughs> I gotta Jaguar? root for Blake Bortles, even though Blake Bortles, mm. <laughs> You know, like, but, and, and that's what politics has become, is that, like, you have to root for your team no matter what. And so any night on CNN, you can go on, and, and, and I don't really watch the CNN shows all that much, but every, every now and then I do, and I've got people that I love, and I love when they snap back at somebody on the other side, and the other side snaps at them, and I'm sure that there are people that love that other side as well. And, and I was watching it one night, and I realized that this is like, it's a spectator sport. Like, I, I am, like, engaging and loving these people fight each other, but that's not doing anything to move us forward. Correct. Right. And, and there was actually a, an analysis in The New Yorker that had that exact same um, metaphor for how politics is now. Um, but, but that's up to us. Yes, and, and this, this question, a major problem with mainstream media's so-called objectivity is giving both sides of any issue equal weight. For example, the nearly 100% of legitimate scientists working on climate change countered by industry paid propagandists. This is one example, right, of the false equivalency phenomenon that, that I think the media struggles with and has called objectivity. But this audience member wants to know... <sighs> So, well, is there any way to better clarify or educate audiences on the differences between reporting the news and analyzing and interpreting mm -hmm. the news and what perspectives are influencing the news? Because I think it, it, it is what will get us through this spectator sport uh, way of reporting, right? So that people can reach conclusions that are actually useful when they enter the voting booth or, or make other decisions that affect their and other people's lives. So any advice on this, Holly Kernan? Well, I wanted to get to that notion of objectivity. It's actually not a word that we use. Um, we use fair, factual, and comprehensive. Um, and we actually, I, I teach, or used to teach journalism a lot, and we're actually asking people to be aware of their perspectives, to really look at your generation, your geography, your ethnicity, your class, um, and your gender, and, and, and understand how that affects how you look at the world so that you can figure out what are my blind spots as I go into this so I can lead with curiosity, so I can really try and give you a comprehensive view of what's happening. And we try never to do that false equivalency. Well, some people say global warming is happening and some people say it's not, you decide. Like that's not journalism. That's just lazy um, right. lack of doing Yes, but I would definitely say that NPR and member stations, including ours, uh, definitely before the Trump administration, were very guilty of false equivalencies, right? It was and like I a way of And I think we're still showing, guilty of it because you, we you're living in this, in this 
false notion of some sort of objectivity. There is objective truth, and there are facts, that evidence that you can prove, and it's our job to, to, to try and figure out what's happening and then to tell you a story. And we have a premise that people are rational actors, so if I'm not understanding, if your behavior looks uh, odd to me, I'm not looking at it through the right lens. And we try to really have these kind of perspectives. Generally, if you're an actor in a story, you're not going to tell that story, except if you're Al. Uh, Al was at a protest uh, oh, no. in Berkeley, um, and he is my hero. A guy was getting beat up. Um, it was one of these, um, it was going to be a white nationalist rally, and you had the counter protesters, lots more counter protesters than um, white nationalists. And Al, this guy was getting beat, he thought, to death. And Al jumped on top and put his body over his so that um, this guy wouldn't get beat up. And then, like any good journalist, he turned it into product. He had the, <laughs> he went back and he, he you know, he no, told the problem was story. I lied to my boss about it, and he was like, "Well, now we got to do an episode." So. Mm -hmm. no. Well, Al Letson, you are the reporter on this panel, and I guess the question that I would have for you is, what is the role of being an objective journalist today? Right? I mean, whether or not you want to use that term, but I mean, how has the how has that role and how it's understood had to change in light of all the norms that have changed around journalism? I, you know, I may not be the best person to answer that question. I, I'll, uh, I will, because I am a journalist, but I'm very much a host where I get to, I do the easy work. Um, the people at CIR are the ones who like really roll up their sleeves. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to let host secrets out, but other people do. <laughs> um, <laughs> listen, I, I got to go back to those journalists and they're going to be looking at me like, really? Um, <laughs> what I will say is where we are right now, the stakes are so high. Right. They are, they are impossibly high. We were talking about... Uh, in the green room, how in many ways, like it feels like we are living in some kind of. Um, I think someone said that uh, the, uh, someone was in jail and they came out and realized that they were in the middle of the most boring dystopian novel ever. Um, <laughs> and I think that's kind of a, 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 a good way to sum it up: is that the stakes are really high. We're in this uh, dystopian world right now that maybe we don't recognize as that, but it, but it is. And I think that. Um, when it comes to objectivity, when it comes to uh, journalism, to me, I think, you know, kind of dovetailing with what Holly said is that there's truth, mm -hmm. right? There's, we know that there are facts, and we as journalists have to act like they, like they are facts. We have to treat them as such, even if uh, everybody around us doesn't want to. Um, and so, like, when you're covering something like climate change, it's a fact that it's happening. When you're covering the president and you're trying to decide whether he's a racist or not, he's a racist. It's a fact. <laughs> it's a fact. No, I mean, tell, prove to me that it's not a fact. Like, everything that he has done has based this fact. And I'm tired of, like, people trying to sit around, figure out whether it is or not. Like, the evidence is there. It's clear. It's fact. We as journalists need to act that way. He's not the first racist president. He's not the first. So I, I don't understand why it's like this big thing that we all have to wrestle with. We deal with fact, and that's what we do. We tell stories around that fact. We tell stories around how that racism affects people throughout the country. Um, we tell stories about how that racism seeps into everybody around him um, and how it ends up as being policy. Yes, and I think that what you're getting at too is, is maybe helping to answer the question that people ask about, is it really worthwhile to cover every provocative or racist or awful thing that this person says? But I think the reality of the situation is what are the stakes if you don't? I mean, are you normalizing it if you ignore it, right? And, and what are the criteria to determine. It, it was something we struggled with just last Friday about whether or not to torpedo one of our local segments on forum to talk about his comments where, um, you know, where he reportedly called African nations should hold countries, right? And, and it was a real struggle, to be honest, to, to make that decision. I was very much in favor of covering it, and I think the main reason I was was because um, 
It's extraordinary, right, to have a president quoted as saying that. And there are real consequences, particularly for the people at Targets, but also people of color generally, to have a president make those kinds of statements. And, you know, people of color, in, I, at least my own experiences, when there is something that is said like that, there is a ripple that goes through Absolutely. this country. And your sense of the tension ratcheting Absolutely. up, you feel it, right, from a just a very central place. And, and so that's why, right, that's, that's, that's why you cover some of those things. But it is a case-by-case -case decision that news organizations do have to make, and, and, that's, and that's the challenge. Carolina Nunez, as Al Letson was talking, I, could, I felt like yeah, you wanted to jump in. it's the same for us, and I see Holly's point, which I profoundly admire. You know, it, 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 it's true that you have to take a stand and then this sense of objectivity and but f it, for Univisionists um, many people can say and have said that we are advocacy journalism and hmm. our response to that is well we we have a, a commitment and a mandate to cover our communities and and really give them all they need as much as we can and if if for you that's advocacy then then we are you know, what and, can you do? <laughs> and do you think you would have said that before 2016? I, uh, for, for the case of Univision, yes. Okay. Honestly, <laughs> yes. We've been in this, doing the same for always. It's been our mm -hmm. place. But if Univision is an advocacy network, then so is Fox News. Like, why is it that, like, only when you're talking about uh, African Americans, Latinos, or whatever, that you talk about it in this lens of its advocacy? But it's, it's like the idea that um, only, uh, wh what's the word, uh, the politic word, I can't think of it. Um, when you're talking about race politics or whatever. Identity um, politics. Identity politics, thank you. Um, it's the idea that like identity politics is only being done by African Americans or Latinos mm -hmm. or LGBTQ is, is absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at what Donald Trump did when he was trying to get elected, that was identity politics. But because it was identity politics to white people, we don't call it that. Every form of politic in America is identity. It's all based on identity. You can go back and look at every, every single president and point out where they were doing identity politics. With Nixon, it's really easy. You know, I mean, it's all across the board. So if, if, if what they're doing is considered advocacy uh, journalism, uh, then what is happening on Fox News should be considered the same. Well, I think it's, I mean, you could call, I think advocacy is actually too kind a word for what Fox is doing, but, mm -hmm. but, yeah, but that, I agree with I'm your point. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> we we <laughs> talk about what is happening. This is another, and I'm going to, this is the last comment I'm going to read because I think it segues nicely into, into how we're going to conclude this conversation. We talk about what is happening. However, the question is, how do we change things or turn this around? And I be, I'm curious to know, and I'd like to hear from each of you, is the situation, do you think the situation is or will improve is a hostile media climate a moment of time that will pass? Or do you think that, that what has happened in these last, you know, 18 months or so, right, or two years, will have lasting effects that will fundamentally change the role of, of journalism? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I, this wasn't just an 18-month-old phenomenon. There have no. been people who have been trying sure. to right. um, diminish public trust in all kinds of institutions, media. But you think this is comparable? I think we've ratcheted it up, you know, like fivefold. But it's it's all a sort of continuum, and um, so so yes, I think that this is doing permanent damage to people's ability to feel that our commonalities are greater than our differences um, and you know that some people consume one media some people consume another studies have shown that um, people on the right tend to have more partisan medias and people on the so-called left tend to consume more variety of sources um, that just came out I have the study right here um, 
and I think that those trends seem to be continuing, but it, the majority of people are not doing that. Like 65% of the American population is not doing that. They're getting their information from a variety of sources. They still believe in mostly our fundamental institutions. But yes, we have an erosion of trust in our society. I think it's a crisis point for our democracy. I think that anybody who is trying to um, demean and diminish and belittle human beings, I'm skeptical of that viewpoint. Um, just because I don't think you need it to have a, a nuanced argument about immigration policy or global or what to do about global warming, um, but it, if you if you have to lie or use disinformation to push your point of view, I, I'm very skeptical of that point of view. So, so I think it's up to everybody who is paying attention and wants to pay attention, and I just hope we have the stamina conti to continue to do it, to make changes to our system, to to recognize what's broken from social media to um, some of the norms of society and traditions that need to be codified in the law. Um, but it's up to us. Ultimately, it's up to us. This is supposed to be a participatory democracy. I think we got apathetic. Um, and I think that forces, both domestic and foreign, really have a stake in us in creating chaos in our society. And it's up to us to say no. Pete Davies, permanent damage. What can be done to turn this around? So I was thinking earlier when we were talking about consequences. Uh, and I think this is the first time we talked about democracy. And like we, we think, I, th I think we probably hope, or many of us hope, that consequences, uh, if, if in no other way, like will come at a ballot box. Uh, but the thing that, I, and I, uh, hopefully someone can, can lift with a bit more optimism after me. But uh, the thing that, the thing that I, I think about and worry about is that you, you see, uh, I think there was a there was a poll at some point after the tax cut bill uh, that showed that something 40 plus percent of respondents believed that Obamacare had been repealed, and uh, I think that when you when you see things like that and you realize that a common understanding of facts underpin democracy, that if you just don't have common understanding and people see like the same, I mean, you talked earlier about facts and you couldn't get clear about what is written in the legislation about what has happened. Uh, how do you how do you have trust in democracy? I think it's a for me that's a scary thing, and and trust is the key word. I don't uh, I don't know I, I don't have like a magic solution for how journalism can rebuild trust with audiences, how audiences can rebuild trust with what they hear and what they see, until they connect with uh, and feel the consequences directly on themselves. Mm -hmm. And and that may be what has got to happen. Is that like you you only experience and realize that something is false when you actually yourself experience the consequences of the falsehood. Mm -hmm. Carolina, um, I, I think um, beyond the consequences for media, because uh, you know we can talk for hours about that here. I, I'm I'm more worried fundamentally about the consequences for a community, honestly, because at the end of the day, those are real consequences. Mm -hmm for all the dreamers, for, for the people that have TPS, for all, all the communities I cover. And that is permanent damage in, in, in most cases, and that's real. So I'm really most worried about that. No turnaround ideas. The, actually, uh, to leave it a little bit hopeful on, on whether or not it happened. <laughs> I knew you'd come around now. I, 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 America, uh, America is, a, is, is a pendulum, right? And 10 years ago, I didn't think Barack Obama could be president, and nor did I think that Donald Trump could ever be president. And that says everything about this country. <laughs> it says everything. And so, like, while things may be falling apart, things are being renewed, and things fall apart, and things are renewed, and we're in that pendulum cycle. So whether or not we come back around, I think absolutely it comes back around. It may be when my child is sitting in this seat and not me but um but I, I i have hope and and i think that like every every time the pendulum swings high one way it swings high the other way but hopefully when it centers up we've moved forward in progress a little bit um but that's just a hope carolina nunez of Univision, Al Letson of Reveal with the Center for Investigative Reporting, Holly Kernan with KQED, and Pete Davies with LinkedIn. Thanks all of you for being on the panel. Thank you.
And again, there is a reception out there for you to continue the conversation with these esteemed panelists. This meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. <laughs>